Hi everybody, my name is Rick, and today I'm going to talk about IT security governance. This video is somewhat based on a blog post I wrote recently for Mach 37. They're a cybersecurity startup accelerator. I put a link to that blog post in the description below in case you want to have a written account of the topic for this talk. And to clarify, governance does not refer to the role of a Jane Austen era woman who was hired to watch her kids. That's a different thing. Did that joke land? Very well. Anyway, governance is the name of a program that links organizational risks to IT risks and threats. Because IT security is not about protecting IT, it's about protecting the organization or business or mission. No IT control should be implemented without being able to tie back to an organizational risk that it's helping to manage, mitigate, or reduce its impact. Governance is the link between the humans who manage the technical controls and the business owners who process data, systems, or applications to align their requirements. Every enterprise has a goal to stay in business, and there are numerous examples in the news every week that prove that, that IT security breaches or incident can threaten that goal. There was actually a news story, I'll put it over here, about five years ago posing that 60% of small companies who suffer a breach go out of business within six months. Well, I think this might be a bit exaggerated. There are significant and unexpected impacts resulting from an organization being hacked, you know, such as loss of intellectual property, theft of money, reduction of reputation or customer trust, cost to recover business after an incident, cost of regulatory fines or loss of contracts and, and other things. These impacts therefore could easily put an organization out of business. I spent much of my career going back and forth between a security management consultant and a CISO. My previous position for almost five years was a virtual CISO for a number of organizations in different industries in different parts of the world. What I found repeatedly was the one thing that most immature IT security organizations lack is a formal governance program. Every organization actually has some level of a governance risk and compliance program, though it might not be formal. It could be just needing to meet the industry or customer security requirements, you know, based on a contract. Or it's the business owner just saying this information or platform or application or business process is important to the business and it must be protected or must always stay on. So, but having an informal strategy you'll see is, is not enough. As well as linking the business risk to technical controls, governance also establishes ownership. I've said many times before that technical people don't make business decisions, and risk-based decisions are business decisions. Identifying business ownership for data, systems, applications, and even infrastructure is, is foundational. Governance is best when it's based on a framework. There are several security standards out there. Some are mandatory requirements for organizations in certain industries, while others are optional, a set of guidelines that can build or show leading practices for security maturity. Many organizations have some industry regulation that they need to meet, but being compliant to one or more of those regulations or standards doesn't necessarily make you secure. Not being compliant is a man to these mandatory standards is a business risk. How big that impact is depends on the organization in the industry. Non-compliance could just be a fine, it could be restricted from working on specific types of contract, or in the case of retail, not being able to accept specific payment types like credit cards. So other examples include, for instance, if you work for a US government contractor, not meeting the NIST cybersecurity framework or FedRAMP could impact your ability to support government contracts. If you are a service provider, having an ISO 27001 certification or SOC 2 might help with third party assessments by customers or it might be a requirement to bid on a specific contract. And as I said, being PCI compliant is mandatory for retail for anyone who takes credit cards. Otherwise, the business might be A, subject to fines or B, prevented from taking credit cards, which could be a business impact. There are a small percentage of organizations that don't have a for, that aren't formally subject to any regulations, industry standards or other frameworks. So like insurance companies, manufacturing companies, business to business retail or legal firms, you know, may not have like some, you know, industry standard that they have to meet like, you know, financial and healthcare do. Um, but they face a different challenge of, of managing their cybersecurity program, ironically, because they struggle with where to start or being able to have buy-in from leadership because there is no like compliance they have to meet so what do we base our program on so they need to benchmark something to describe their customers and third-party partners and this is where one of the more university secure universal security frameworks can come into play 
So getting back to the frameworks, there are four types. There's risk frameworks, program frameworks, and, and NIST and ISO both are risk and program frameworks in their library. Control frameworks, uh, CIS controls in my previous videos, as well as NIST are two other examples. And attack frameworks like the MITRE attack framework and the Lockheed Martin kill chain. So these frameworks can be from either regulatory sources, you know, like, you know, HIPAA for healthcare, NERC for energy companies, GOBA for finance. They could be from standards bodies like, you know, ISO, COBIT and CIS or industry verticals like, you know, PCI for retail or EDUCAUSE for higher education. I won't dig into the details of these frameworks in this video. That is a whole other video. Uh, so, but let me know if you're interested in it and I'll, I'll put one together. I will say that these frameworks are hierarchical. You would use a risk framework to define, uh, measure and manage your IT risk and a program framework to map your IT risk program to make it measurable and reportable. And then finally leverage a control framework to, for how to apply controls to meet these requirements. The tool most likely used for managing all of this, you know, technical and risk governance and risk mapping is a risk register. Basically a risk register is a list of what IT threats could impact the organization and include their likelihood and impact. And I'll, I'll put that over here as an example of a risk register. Uh, this way you can define whether to accept, mitigate, or transfer the risk, track implementation of remediation, or go deeper into comparing mitigated versus unmitigated risks and impact. Uh, this could be a spreadsheet, like we say here, or a full-blown, expensive GRC application that lists, tracks, measures risks based on categories and severity, tracks what controls are in place to manage those risks, and what extent the risk is managed or to an appropriate level. This risk levels can be quantified or qualified, and I'll talk about those later. And you should have a policy that defines what that acceptable risk level is and an exception process if the business chooses to accept that risk. And only the business can choose to accept it, not the IT people. So when I say qualified, that means that there's an estimate of impact uh, defined by the business leadership. They may say, like, it would be really bad if we lost this data. Or on the other end, it could be, eh, it'd be inconvenient, but it really would impact the end business if we lost that data. Oftentimes, these are noted as an impact range from like one to five from least to most impactful. The term quantified refers to using a calculation to determine to percent of likelihood and impact and based on business data, calculate the dollar value to that impact. It takes account for the value of the data, the maturity and comprehensiveness of security controls protecting that data and, and other factors. Quantified risk would be something like you have a 50% likelihood of that data will be compromised, which would be a $15 million impact. And there are guidelines for, for developing and creating these models from the FAIR Institute and from the CIS uh, risk assessment methodology. Uh, so they have good details of like how you would actually do these and run these models and describe that. But no matter which approach, the goal is to prioritize protections and detections that would draw down the organization's risk based on the threat or incident that would be most impactful. If you don't already have a risk framework or don't know where to start, I listed 10 questions to define basic governance in the blog post I mentioned earlier. And I'll put those questions in the description below, but I won't go in through them now. That again will be a, a future video. The final discussion around governance is about business leadership buy-in. The leadership must understand the role in IT governance. They can't just let the IT security leader define what's important to protect and what level of risk they're willing to accept and what level of controls need to be implemented to meet that risk. Well, they may have a part in this last one. <laughs> um, but this understanding of business leadership roles is critical to a successful security program. And this is that linkage that I mentioned before that I saw missing all the time when I was a virtual CISO. Business leaders are the ones responsible for to keep the organization in business. So they make the risk decisions. It takes cooperation to understand the best way to link the IT security and the business risk. I have a video that talks about how to be more effective, to get buy-in with senior leadership, leadership, and I'll put that thumbnail here, uh, and that talks about you know how to talk to leaders in their language. We can't talk technical, and I'll, like I said, I'll put a link to that in the description below as well. So that's it for now. I just wanted to give a quick overview of governance with some explanation of what it is and how it's implemented. Please feel free to ask me any questions in the comments below. And if you found this useful, please like and subscribe to catch my future videos. Have a great day.